again, Alex here with Better Years. Today we have Daniel Gallucci back on. Daniel is our foremost concussion and post-concussion syndrome expert up in Canada. He is the CEO of DG Squared. Um, and today we have a great talk. We go ahead and dive into this article on Frontline, um, specifically recounting uh, some tests and some discoveries that were made between 2003 and 2009 in the brains of former NFL players. Um, specifically regarding CTE. This is a brain that has been um, obviously cut in half and shown to have advanced CTE. We will discuss what CTE is, what it means for you and I, even though we're not professional athletes. I don't know if you are, but I'm not. But um, we did play some sports in high school. We may have kids um, that are enrolled in hockey, soccer, football, any of these impact sports. Um, and we talk about how to prevent CTE, what it means, what it, what it can mean, and, um, and we try to give you as much information on it as possible. Enjoy. All right, so um, I gave a little intro to our talk today. Um, this article I'm showing here on the screen next to you, um, published in Frontline um, earlier this year, and uh, it's specifically talking about kind of the epidemic that just really got um, um, got enough press coverage and enough um, attention to um, spawn some some documentaries and a, a major motion picture starring Will Smith will show a trailer of that pretty soon um, so it, it's essentially um, the fact that NFL players former NFL players are beginning to um, reach their their later years of life and um, a number have passed away and they are starting to discover and attribute um, those deaths to brain disease um, specifically a brain disease uh, called CTE or, or um, a disorder of the brain called CTE um, so I guess we should start by kind of um, giving a general overview of, of the article and the topic so um, the article um, specifically is uh, 87 deceased NFL players test positive for brain disease. So in this article, the article, uh, the author, sorry, states um, that 87 out of 91 tested NFL players or former, former NFL players, sorry, have tested positive for brain disease. Um, most lay people like myself associate the words brain disease with um, cancer uh, dementia or Alzheimer's that's kind of what we're told um, is, is typical for brain disease quote-unquote um, with this uh, article specifically is referring to a condition called um, uh, let me see if I can get this straight uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy uh, mouthful there um, or CTE is what we'll refer to it in the rest of this discussion but um, it's uh, a dramatic expression of tau proteins in the brain of middle-aged former athletes uh, as the disease stat is based on um, can you explain um, real generally CTE to the viewers and give us an idea of how much or how little physical impact is necessary to cause such a condition? Sure, yeah. Um, Alex, it is. It's, it's, it's a bit tough because it was, it was a bit shocking to see that uh, report that came out a little while ago. Um, even more shocking is are some of the more recent developments that we're seeing in regards to CTE, which we'll go through in a little bit. But um, yeah, basically CTE, or you nailed it, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is a uh, progressive neurodegenerative disease and um, you know it does it, it, it shares some of the similarities that we see with some of the other brain diseases as you'd said uh, particularly dementia and particularly Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease and you know the thing is we'd actually first seen this this isn't new um, we've known about this disease since the 1920s I believe there was a neuropathologist out of um, I think it was New Jersey mm -hmm. back in the 1920s and he was finding that uh, with some of these retired boxers they were having movement coordination issues impulsivity speech problems memory problems physical tremors 
and when uh, he started dissecting these people's brains, he 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 noticed this uh, this pathology in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the first paper was produced, I believe, in somewhere in around 1966. And then we didn't see it for a long time, and then it's kind of reared its ugly head again, uh, beginning with Mike Webster. Um, you're going to show some of the clip with Dr. Bennett Amalu, who was the first guy that kind of picked up on it again. Um, but it has been around for a long time, and uh, which was called dementia pugilistica before because it was so commonly seen in boxers, but now seeing it in, in mm-hmm. other sports, primarily football. And you'll see that uh, just like in Alzheimer's, there's what's called tau is that protein. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it provides structure to neurons. Um, that structure help governs the way that a lot of these neurons will fire. And this in this type of disease, we see that it's called hyperphosphorylated tau. So there's a phosphate that gets added to it, which seems to be from the trauma. And then what happens is that breaks down the structure of the neurons. Um, it tangles begin forming. Uh, and then the function of those neurons itself begins to suffer. So this once soluble uh, structured neuron ends up becoming insoluble and very inefficient mm-hmm. over time, leading to uh, leading to a deadly disease. Okay, and I'm showing a, an image of a healthy brain and then a brain that's kind of been overrun with tau proteins and um, they're darker, they're concentrated. Um, yeah look like they uh, yeah they could become problematic Um, I don't know if they block any of the neuron receptors or or what they do specifically but that's what they're kind of finding they cut open all of these former NFL players brains uh, the deceased brains obviously and um, found uh, this trend and um, prove 95% of of the brains that they tested um, tested positive for these tau proteins so yeah and that's the thing is that we can't the only way we can right now diagnose it is post-mortem. So unfortunately, mm-hmm. these people have to be um, deceased to be able to conclusively diagnose. There are some efforts underway right now to be able to identify this type of disease in, in, in living people, but that's still a, uh, a little ways off. And in, in terms of the cause, it's it's hard to say. That's where we, we still haven't really been able to go in terms of science yet. Mm-hmm. Um you know, we're starting to see the correlation is there in terms of the amount of impact mm-hmm. and the progression of this disease, but we can't say that a certain amount of trauma or a certain amount of impact will cause CTE because there's still, you know, there's still many players, there's people out there who we haven't looked at their brains, there's people that have suffered other types of trauma, and they haven't really seen this sort of damage in there. So, while the correlation is there and it's something that needs to be studied further, we're not at the point yet that we can say it's it's causative. But we're 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 looking to get there. Uh, you know, we're looking to get there probably pretty soon. Okay, perfect. And um, the next point I, I'd like to to help uh, help make through this is is uh, that the finding of the article, or at least one of the major mentions of the article. Um, is the repeat of uh, minor head trauma that occurs regularly. So when linebackers um, get up there on the line in scrimmages and then practice, scrimmage, practice, game, scrimmage, practice, game, they um, they suffer from these minor head traumas, which um, you don't typically um, see signs of concussion after these. Um, stop me if I'm incorrect, but... It's more of just the repetitive brain just smashing up against the uh, inner sides of the skull that uh, that cause this regular um, this regular um, uh, damage or, or um, onset of, of these these diseases and um, a big uh, scary thing that they are going to um, hopefully not find but something that's going to come out is is a situation where where kids even at the youth level, um, they found a kid that um, in, in the Frontline documentary that I watched that um, the kid actually died, um, was a linebacker, he was in high school, and um, CTE um, signs were found in his brain as well. So it's a situation where it's the repetitive head trauma. Can you, uh, can you explain kind of what that, um, what that is and, and what that means? Sure, and I, I think that's probably the, the most important thing that needs to be looked at now across sort of all sports because, again, while we can't say that it's causative, 
um, the correlation is definitely there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you think about it, 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 it really does make sense. These people that are sustaining these submaximal hits repeated over and over and over again, they're just consistently altering their brain chemistry on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. and, and when we think back from an evolutionary standpoint, how, you know, how detrimental that would be if I was, you know, I, I tell people sometimes if I was, you know, uh, in ancient China, you know, 800 years ago, and I was fighting Genghis Khan, you know, and I took a big club over the head, you know, I'd be put in an infirmary for a period of time, I wouldn't be able to do anything, that would instill some sort of neuroprotective healing type mechanism, and then maybe I'd come back out, maybe get my head cut off, cut off another day. But, you know, the, the reality of it is, it, it, it is dangerous to put people out there in a situation where they're just under this sort of uh, damage over and over again. And when you think about it, we, we sometimes focus, I think, too much on just the brain cells. We look at these neurons and we know there's 85 or some odd billion in there. What's more important is you look at the support structure. When we were talking about tau proteins and some of the supporting cast to these neurons here, you got to look at the glial cells in the brain, which are totally separate from the neurons. You got neurons in the brain, and then you got glial cells in the brain. And these glial cells that are thought to be really supportive for function, they're now even. We're starting to see that they're even more than just as a supportive role that's just kind of gluing neurons together. And they, you know, they will do anything from be sort of pro-inflammatory or sorry, inflammatory in nature, where they can help clear out damage and regulate nerve function. But we're starting to see that if this microglial and this glial cell environment is put under too much stress, it automatic it all of a sudden goes from a anti-inflammatory, really good, you know, just like kind of janitors in the school where they're in there and they're cleaning up and they're doing a really good job, and then they get overworked and tired, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it flips. They start spilling bleach all over the place and things like that, and it becomes now all of a sudden a pro-inflammatory cytotoxic environment that's very disruptive and we don't have enough information yet in terms of these exact processes they're being looked at right now that's why it's hugely important when people are suffering from these injuries that we try and pull them away for a little bit got it that's a good synopsis um so specifically um this article is talking about nfl players um right. obviously the nfl is is a large corporation draws a lot of attention so when nfl players die the media gets involved those stories get um, carried out etc but it's obviously not the only impact sport that's out there hockey um even soccer um skiing um all those types of uh, sports um so uh, are there any other uh, areas that you've seen this um or at least signs symptoms um uh, of this type of situation happening we we have hockey's you know a good one um up here in canada it's you know the most popular sport that we we have up here uh played a ton throughout the u.s as well and in europe and other places um unfortunately we're, we're seeing the same sort of things you know a guy mm -hmm. that that i knew um quite well was was diagnosed with with cte after committing suicide earlier this year that played in the nhl um Similar to the, you know, there was that 25-year-old, I think a week ago, Adrian Robinson, and, and his autopsy report was just released and showed the same sort of thing. So we, we are seeing it in hockey. Um, we've, we've seen it in soccer as well. Uh, it, it, it's terrifying just when you look at the concussion rates, particularly in, in, in females in soccer. Yeah, um, I heard that. And we all have our theories as to why that could possibly be the place, uh, be what could be the, the cause of that. Um, I, you see a ton of these sorts of injuries in lacrosse, in rugby, and then some of the even less expected things. So we've had uh, numerous, you know, very bad concussions in cheerleading. Uh, I've had some in tennis, which you would never imagine. Bowling, a chess player, I had a chess guy get up that hit his head on like a thing. So, you know, it's you, you, you can see it almost all over the place. But the reality of it is these these contact heavy sports are the ones that you said like you said are going to put these people at risk on a daily mm -hmm. basis so you, you really have to watch with uh, with those sports there for sure yeah that's um that's very interesting the chess player i, yeah, I couldn't that's a rough one. 
I couldn't imagine. It took them a while to recover, too. Jeez. Oh, wow. Makes us all kind of think back to yeah. those times when we hit our heads and wonder yeah. what. And, you know, the thing is, you know, just like this this guy, Adrian Robinson, that did, uh, you know, that done the autopsy on, and he was 25 years of age, played in the NFL for a few years. There's going to be guys that played in the NFL for 20 years. They live now to 85 years of age. They'll look at their brains, and then they won't see CTE. So it's, it's, it's really about trying to track these things and, and get as much information as as we can because we we need to know you know is what are the you know when we look at some of these people what are the other factors there what's their blood pressure which is a factor for alzheimer's disease what are their insulin levels how are they eating how are they sleeping do they have chronic pain what are their what are what are the mm -hmm. certain genes the mapt genes that we see in, in in some of these issues here how's what are their genomics looking like and it's that sort of framework that needs to be put together to really figure out this this sort of problem here. But uh, yeah, it's, it's quite the task for sure. Well, um, that's a good little uh, little intro to um, what what I'm about to show real quick. And and we found this uh, in the research before uh, this <laughs> talk. But Will Smith has been casted to play uh, Dr. Bennett Amalu. Um, he was the forensic pathologist who was the first to publish findings related to um, CTE in American football players. Um, right. He was kind of um, credited, discredited, credited again with this whole um, this whole situation with with the NFL. So um, let's see if I can't pull up a uh, a trailer on this. When I was a boy, heaven was here and America was here you could be anything you could do anything I am the wrong person to have discovered this if you don't speak for them who will disease that no one has ever seen. Repetitive head trauma chokes the brain. The NFL does not want to talk to you. You turned on the lights and gave their biggest boogeyman a name. You're going to war with a corporation that owns a day of the week. No proof was presented today because there simply isn't any. They have to listen to us. This is bigger than they are. What do you think they're doing to you now? That's nothing. You have no idea how bad this could get. I have to keep going. They want you to say you made it all up. If they continue to deny my work, men continue to die. Sometimes in life, you're asked to leave it alone. But sometimes you can't. Who are you? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Okay, so um, that trailer and that movie, I'm actually pretty excited to see it. I watched, did you yeah. watch the, um, the Frontline documentary that I linked at the bottom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, You've probably seen, seen it it's, before, it's yeah. Wild. Yeah, so um, the movie and the documentary, both linked, uh, embedded in this article, um, uh, kind of bring to light that uh, between 2003, when this um, sort of came to light, and 2009, the NFL, um, their mild traumatic brain injury committee um, has now been disbanded, uh, right. but they concluded um, in a series of scientific, published scientific papers that no NFL player had experienced chronic brain damage from repeat concussions. Um, obviously incorrect and um, a lot of backlash and since then they've done donations and uh, they've they've given millions to um, to a couple of um, Boston, Boston's um, um, lab that's, that's studying CT and and continued this work and um, while still publishing that there's no link while still that's, publishing that's, that they they still haven't determined uh, yada yada right. yada you know um, so a lot of politics going on here around this subject but um, 
the situation being um, it is prevalent um, just because it's uh, it's in the NFL and uh, seen there first um, doesn't mean it, it doesn't impact every single athlete, um, sports player in general, and, and people that uh, may not play sports. Maybe they just had right. some bad luck and, and received a lot of uh, a lot of brain impacts over the years. Um, sure. um, so um, impact sports uh, organizations um, are, are still working hard to disprove Dr. Amalu in general. Um, they want to obviously continue uh, making it a physical game, and, and we understand that. Um, but um, what do you kind of perceive as, as the lasting impact of, of these studies and, and the media's attention towards this now? Um, where do you kind of see society taking this and, and the future of, of, of CTE, uh, care, prevention, et cetera? Yeah, that's it's it's a it's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, I'm 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 kind of in in, in two spaces on it. Uh, you know, you look at the one side of it, and with the movie, and I think the movie's going to be great. I think it's going to start to address some really important questions that maybe some people uh, haven't asked as yet. Mm -hmm. um, I also think sort of the ephemeral nature of Hollywood itself that it'll be pretty short-lived in that um, it won't be able to sort of create the sort of groundswell that we that we really need you know one of the Kardashians will do porn again or something and then George Clooney gets divorced or you know and it's it's and then it's going to be swept under the rug and we're going to move on to something else the biggest thing I think and, and those guys in Boston uh, Chris Nowinski and the Sports Legacy Institute out of BU have done a great job of it and there needs to be more people like that we're trying to do the same thing up here in Canada with this new Empower Foundation. It's 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 really about you know trying to get down to that grassroots sort of level and change. We we just need to educate people better. We need to be better advocates and we need to educate people better in terms of what these things are. And we do we want people to be active. We want them to be playing sport at a high level. We just need to arm them first with the information to allow them to do so in a safe a manner as possible and if that involves more rule changes if that involves more things to the actual infrastructure of these games themselves then they need to be done in order to protect these people but i, I really don't think and having been involved in this for a, for a long period of time and you see things that that come and go and you know it, it's it's only really starting to see it uh take hold when it's starting really at that grass, grassroots level and, and fundamentally these ideas start to change and you know we're going to use professional athletes to do that because they're almost they're seen as paragons as indestructible paragons in our society that can't do anything wrong mm -hmm. so when we can use them and, and, and use them as our sort of educational and informational tool to the general public and to kids and to parents out there then we're hoping that uh, they will begin to understand and um, yeah, just kind of uh, give the message that, uh, that all of us, that many of us are trying to, to, to bring across right now. Yeah, and you kind of touched on this, but um, is there any advice that you'd have um, for parents that are you know, obviously enrolling their kids in youth sports right now? Um, they've got all the pads, they've got all the gear, they've got the helmets. Um, Clearly, now we're discovering that may not be all, but any, any specific advice for prevention or, or, or even just monitoring? Is there anything that... Um... I really do. I, I think that, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, we do, we need to look at things from a preventative standpoint. And while there's not that much out there, there are things that we've seen, like hydration is huge. And you wouldn't believe being in clinic every day. You wouldn't you wouldn't believe how many of the kids, probably 70, 80 percent of the kids that I see, whether they're concussed or not, are coming in and they're dehydrated. So mm -hmm. being able to just have decent hydration levels, like have these kids actually see good job there, have these kids actually drinking water consistently throughout the day is going to be huge for them. You know, to be able to have a good diet of whole foods that aren't stuck with that aren't jammed with refined and processed sugars that are already just going to lead to inflammation before they even get out on the field you mm. know like we're trying to stop some of the things here 
and it's tough. But in some of the rinks here, you have vending machines, and these kids are walking out with co- in or out with Coca Colas and chips and this and that. And these are these are kids getting ready to get drafted to junior hockey. Like it's it's insane that these sorts of things happen. So again, it comes down to educating them. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. So you just touched on something important. So earlier we mentioned spiked blood sugar. Um, yeah. You mentioned hydration now. Yeah. Um, so it's a situation where um, in our youth we have our metabolisms. We don't look at food as, as something that's impacting right. our brain. We look at it uh, more of a physical energy, etc. cetera. Um, so they're, they're maybe loading up on complex carbs, Red Bulls, heading out to play the games. So you're sure. saying that that spike in blood pressure, the probably dehydrated from a week of blood practice, sugar, yeah. um, and and blood pressure, then that can change or, or increase or maybe have an effect on on their likelihood of getting some brain trauma in that game. Or how does that how does that specifically yeah, I mean, work? I, I you know and again some of this is still research that is coming out now, but when you look at it, it it's just disrupting. It's already when we look at that repeated trauma. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're saying, oh, okay, well, it's not the one big knockout. It's the repeated trauma on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. What is the cellular environment that that person's brain is in on a day-to-day basis? So are they having a pro-inflammatory diet that's just now working with a pro-inflammatory type physical environment that's just leading them down a pro-inflammatory cascade of a metabolic process that's not going to allow them to heal? And so... This gotcha. doesn't manifest that they're able to get through fine at 10 years of age, at 15 years of age, but at 45 years of age, then it starts to become a problem. And gotcha. yeah, we, we see that, you, you can see that, we see that all the time now. And that's one of the things that we do right off the bat. You know, we're already saying that in, a, in an acute scenario, they're already in a, in a hyper glucose type environment. Do we need to pour more on top of that? No. Do we need to be able to, you know, there's already going to be an inherent inflammatory process working its way. Allow that to happen. And then what can we do to support it? Can we add things like brain-derived and trophic factors? And, you know, we're constantly playing with these sorts of things because we make mistakes on a daily basis as well. But at least we're we're looking at it from that perspective. And I think as parents out there, it's, it's so tough because, like we discussed last time, there's thousands of concussion clinics now all over North America Mm -hmm. but if you're not going to speak to somebody or if you're going to speak to somebody and they don't understand physiologically what's going on in the brain when these types of sub maximal plus maximal Mm -hmm. impacts are taking place I don't care if they're great at putting you on an impact test they don't understand what's going on and and those are people that you you have to unfortunately you, you have to stay away from them because they're not only that happened to me today with a kid that was released because he did his one little thing ended up being able to go back on the ice and you know was in vomit it was vomiting was ill and all these sorts of things and if that kid he didn't but if that kid then gets hit again in a traumatic fashion that's potentially seriously dangerous and we can't have these things occurring but you just need to find people that have that uh, that bit of education as to what's going on physiologically in there as well and and not just kind of looking at it from the the outskirts in terms of these little tests and stuff so got it so preventive measures um, at the very least um, watch your diet um, make sure to have lots of fluids going through your blood lots of water specifically going through your blood um, during a game after a game um, and then give your brain it's time to heal. If you, especially if, if you're in an impact sport, um, make sure you give your brain that time to heal the inflammation to do its job and then subside before you go yeah. back out and do do a two a day or do another game or do another yeah. practice. Make sure of that. Um, when in doubt, it. just sit him out. That's what you 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 have to sit him. Yeah, that's a good quote there. I'll quote you on that. <laughs> I like it. All right, I Daniel. Who came up with that? But I stole it. Ah, yeah. oh, it's a great quote. Um, but uh, anyway, so um, great talk. Um, I've got uh, some great uh, images of an advanced CTE brain next to a normal brain. That's um, that's just incredible. But um, thank you again for your time this evening. Um, hope to get on another article and chat about it soon. 
Um, hope you, the baby's uh, healthy and happy. And, and baby's healthy, good. happy. Stayed another half hour pretty quiet, so we're all excited about that. Yeah, I heard a perk up there in the background just now. A but, little uh, bit, yeah. <laughs> that's great. All right, Daniel. He's just saying hello. <laughs> Have a good evening. Thanks, you too, Alex. Take care. See ya. Bye.